Manager and Executive Dire Director, Mr. Kazaka. Mr. Kazaka. Thank you very much. So, so obviously my first words are to say that we had the pleasure to uh, hear to one of our uh, most recent collaborators at uh, South Asia Democratic Forum, uh, Katia Rodriguez, uh, one of uh, the proofs that the Azores is a, a, a terrible uh, land that has lots of very good people, very nice people. Thank you so much. Katya for accepting to uh, make this introduction. Uh, dear members of the European Parliament, President Lansbergis, Sir Graham Watson, Joe Leinen, and uh, my dear friend representing the World Bank here in Brussels, Shandor Shippos. Richard Czarneski just uh, called me a while ago saying that, it, unfortunately, he will be a bit late, but we are waiting for him at any minute. Dear distinguished ambassadors and other members of uh, the uh, diplomatic community here in Brussels, uh, high representatives of uh, international institutions, professors and other guests speakers and uh, uh, that volunteer to address us today from South Asia and Europe, distinguished members of the business community from South Asia, Europe and the US, scholars, academics and students from Heidelberg University, College of Europe and other, other universities across Europe, distinguished associates and volunteers working in SADF, either in Heidelberg or in Brussels, friends and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, getting all of us together to discuss the merits of regional integration, the ways, means and possibilities to an ever more united South Asia on the principles its member states agreed for the Charter of Democracy of their original cut club is a tremendously important and gratifying step for the South Asia Democratic Forum. And I would like to express my deep satisfaction and thanks to your presence, to the whole of you. In the 18 months of the existing of SADF, uh, it came from an offspring of the association some friends of mine in the Middle East and Europe and myself had created in the end of 2010, the Alliance to Renew Cooperation Among Humankind, to become a think tank that is also becoming a reference on relations between Europe and South Asia. We have promoted conferences, studies, and round trips. We established partnerships and close relations with civil society organizations in South Asia. We developed a deep-rooted relation with the South Asia Institute of Heidelberg University. And we count now with one of the most distinguished academics at the institution as our own director of research, Dr. Siegfried Wolf. Uh, the partnership we established with Gallup uh, allowed us to start basic scientific studies on the South Asia public opinion, state of mind regarding all strategic issues on cooperation, peace and development. The Insights South Asia project, uh, whose, uh, whose results on Nepal and Bangladesh are already available, uh, uh, is a flashing point on the roadmap to South Asia regional construction and we are developing our best efforts to continue it as soon as possible elsewhere in the region. <coughs> Following our inaugural conference back in June, it was agreed that we should continue our work on the merits of regional cooperation in South Asia, yet addressing more topics, getting around as what in many cases are the leading personalities in the whole sphere of academic knowledge. And my dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, we will not stop here. Today, this morning, we have already started working on the completion of our work on two of the most critical issues for the whole of the region, empowerment of women and cooperation in water management, two issues that are not dealt with in the present conference. We have a very loaded working day and very prestigious speakers to hear. So I will not take more of your time for the moment, and I am looking forward to address you tonight at the closing session, and I wish you, uh, everyone, a successful and very fruitful day. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Kazako. I would now like to introduce the Emerald Member of the European Parliament, Mr. Joe Leinen. Mr. Leinen. Microphone. <laughs> yeah, uh, dear Paolo Casaca, Chairman, uh, dear colleagues, uh, dear guests, thank you very much for the invitation to address uh, this uh, high level and important conference. What qualifies me to be here on that table? Uh, I have been five years in the EP delegation to South Asia, and uh, when on a certain moment we had to split it into South Asia and India, I continued with the delegation to India, where Sir Graham Watson is my chairman. And we just uh, came from a visit a few months ago, where next to Delhi we have been in Chennai, and uh, dealing with all the questions around, let's say, the south uh, of India. Um, merits of regional cooperation is uh, the topic of this year's uh, conference. And in fact, I think uh, we can learn a lot uh, from each other. South Asia, as Europe, has uh, small countries and big countries. It has developed regions and less developed regions. And it has, as Europe, all the problems of the world. So uh, how do we solve our problems, how we meet the challenges? And there, in Europe, as you know, we had to draw a bitter lesson from hostility, from fanatism, from hate. Uh, I'm from Germany, living exactly in the village to the French border on Alsace-Lorraine. And Germany and France made three wars for hating each other and for territorial questions, Alsace-Lorraine. And then we decided that cooperation is better than confrontation after the disaster of the Second World War. And when I'm over there, I said India and Pakistan made three wars about Kashmir. And there is still not, uh, let's say, peace. And uh, for me, at least, uh, it is clear not to change borders, but to open borders. Make step-by-step step of confidential measures to open borders. And then you would see that people like each other, that they work to each other, and it's for the benefit of, of everybody. Now, today you are uh, uh, addressing uh, some of the key issues, uh, security and peace. I mean, um, uh, peace uh, is not everything, but without peace, a lot of things are not possible. So, of course, uh, peace is a value. Uh, for lots of things of development and well-being. And uh, being a, a chairman and former chairman of the Environment Committee, I think that all your issues like energy, like water, like uh, food, uh, agriculture, uh, necessities are basic needs uh, that have to be developed and uh, can be developed together. Um, I think that SARC has huge potential, not to say uh, you are a booming region. It has all the credentials, all the elements for a good future. And um, we, uh, at the end of that catastrophe of the Second World, Winston Churchill had this famous speech in Zurich where he said, I wish that we develop the United States of Europe. So he might have regretted later to uh, spell out this uh, vision for uh, uh, that's us say, political United Europe. Of course, uh, it's my dream that we get the United States of Europe, and we will be different than the United States of America. It is a different model, it's different conditions, and SAC needs a vision, and it will be again different to what we do in Europe. But uh, I think we can learn a lot from each other, and I welcome very much, uh, Paolo, that you took the initiative from the South Asia democratic forum to bring uh, people together from all uh, stakes and all stakeholders. And I think this can be a fruitful uh, exercise to understand each other, to build up on cornerstones where we have the same objectives and aims. And uh, like in Europe, I said, we have small countries, big countries. Between Germany and France, we had Benelux, and especially the small Luxembourg, 450,000 inhabitants, Germany having 82 million inhabitants, and Luxembourg played a prominent role in mediating. And when I see the ambassador of Sri Lanka, uh, friends from Bangladesh, from Nepal, I think we need as well mediation 
uh, in uh, the South Asia region where maybe the others uh, are not coming together too good and too quickly. At the end, I wish you a big success and look forward to the next conference of this um, good think tank. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lennon. I would now like to present to you President um, Landsbergis, a member of the European Parliament. Mr. Lenz Distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> oh, please. <sit. laughs> when one turns his mind to tales and dreamings of his young years, and also to romantic literature about great geographical discoveries, the high southern seas and ships of brave sailors come back like moving calls and pictures of once forever excited imagination. In our Western and East-Western culture, there is also one special picture of the three magi who came bringing oriental and royal gifts to greet the poorest newborn child. One of them came then from a famous land, usually visited once by Alexander of Europe. Today it all sounds rather dry as South Asia, such a region of the world, among others. And many have to reach yet for books and Googles of geography to become aware about the limits and definitions of it. One of those was me. Yes, we remember there is in South Asia the home area of most ancient noun philosophy and state building traditions based on law of incomparable beauty of architecture and music of over days mighty empires with cosmic religions later fading and turned into a dust, dust. and again our heirs of today are full of rumors and formulas about newly emerging powers somewhere but also there. South Asia is not a region yet with well-developed cooperation and worldwide mission, but may become it. Something essential is needed for that, more than a split group of actors on the stage. Of course they are, but what then? Such new appearance must bring both chances and problems, and it, and it brings problems and chances indeed actually at the same time. That's ongoing. Let the good in that process be welcomed, while evil condemned. Let me say, being a distant and ignorant observer, that situation where two inheritors of King Ashoka and Prince Gautama stay in a long-lasting and so much exhausting war for disputed lands, not souls, looks an absurdity over absurdities. Don't be similar, I could suggest, to your northern Eurasian neighbor, so painfully suffering the illness of territorialism. The unique heritage of Tibetan culture with its unique importance for the entire world cannot be put on the edge of disappearance with slow-minded gawks called international community just watching from around. What a lesson may be brought to us if not stopped from Bhutan. There is a government concerned about people not in terms of material wealth but of happiness. That is something different from our Western chains of mentality. Richness and happiness is not the same, dear economists. You may have money and a cancer together. 
is hardly to be called an achievement. What is then and how accounted your living standard to add the cancer of greediness is not much better of other forms. The classical wisdom of East, that also of South Asia, appears much needed for our unhappy West, unhappy despite its all false values. Let me quote the great poet of Bengali, whom I admired while still young. Prisoner, tell me, who was it that wrote this unbreakable chain? It was I, said the prisoner, who forged this chain very carefully. I thought my invincible power would hold the world captive, leaving me in a freedom undisturbed. Thus, night and day, I worked at the chain with huge fires and cruel hard strokes. When at last the work was done, and the links were complete and unbreakable, I found that it held me in its grip. The poet and philosopher saw this captive by my, himself as a metaphor used for more and more materialist, coast times expansionist, and finally consumerist industrial Western civilization. He wished for India, like Mahatma Gandhi did as well, a different way. What ways we are choosing generally in South Asia, you know better than me. But while the South Asia prefers democracy, there is a question of possible common way for all democracies in the East and West. Completion is better than competition. Consolidation of democracies and bridge between the great democratic entities is of crucial need if we don't want to disappear in a worldwide terrorist war. Anyway, the westernization of South Asia and efforts striving to get one more great self-captive of industrial consumerism, like new big house founded in a swamp of sovereign and community debt, would not be the best way, but rather a lost chance. Of what? That chance could be the merge of different approaches, more rational and more spiritual ones. It is possible, if not absolutely utopian, when the culture is not put behind material profits, and human spirit together with love and compassion, not behind the ever-growing auctions and advertising to consume ever more. Fairness in politics and business, including banking, should stem also from the responsibility and compassion to those eventual victims of confuse and manipulation. Let's love more, assist more, and seek for happiness among the brothers, not enemies. Thank you. Thank you, President Lundsbergis. I would now like to introduce you, Sir Graham Watson. Sir Graham. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me. I must say that as a Brit, to be asked to talk about South Asia always worries me. <laughs> if it is true that the sun never set on the British Empire, it was probably because God would not trust the English in the dark. <laughs> um, I, I congratulate Paolo Kazaka and what he has done in establishing the South Asia Democratic Forum. I think it is hugely important, and I think it is doing hugely important work. Why? Because nobody can now deny that we live in a global economy, an economy of which the contours are drawn in the computer campuses of West Coast America, 
in the coal centers of India, in the factories of China, and an economy in which human interaction is going to be increasingly important. And one of the things that strikes me having to chair the European Parliament's delegation for relations with India is how civilizations rise and fall not according to their material wealth or to their mineral wealth, but according to their values. Of course, if you have efficient capital markets and the rule of law and openness to new ideas, you can do a lot, even in a poor country. But if, too, you have confidence in the ability of your people, if you have the values of compassion and tolerance, then you can achieve far more. And it was not that long ago when here in Europe we were burning Giordano Bruno at the stake for being a heretic, while the great Mughal Emperor Iqbal was codifying a Bill of Rights into the Indian Constitution. Today, here in Europe, we are debating whether we should extradite suspected terrorists to the United States of America, <coughs> while in Kashmir, what is happening is an affront to humanity and a disgrace. We, in our meetings with Indian parliamentarians, talk about lots of things. We talk about trade, we talk about climate change, we talk about renewable energy, we talk about human rights. Probably most of all at the moment we talk about trade because we're trying to negotiate a free trade agreement between the European Union and India. And I have no doubt that a successful outcome of that free trade agreement would be a win-win situation for both sides. But I'm interested that in your program today one of your sessions is entitled The EU-India Free Trade Agreement, A First Step Towards a Sark Economic Space. The role of trade in bringing South Asian countries will be just together will be just as crucial as it has been in bringing the countries of the European Union together. But the role of tolerance, too, in opening that up will be important. And one of the things that fascinates concerns, sometimes worries us, is of course the relationship between India and Pakistan. If you look at the figures for trade, go back to 1948. Do you know what the situation was in 1948? 32% of all Pakistan's imports, a third of all its imports came from India. Over half of all Pakistan's exports went to India. By the 1950s, that had declined to a mere trickle. Look more recently to the 1990s, and you find that Pakistan's exports to India were just half a percent of its total exports, and its imports were just over 1% of its total imports. Now, thankfully, things are changing. They're changing rapidly. Be between 2004 and last year, trade between the two countries had increased ninefold. I think we're talking now of trade that's up to 2.7 billion US dollars in value. And things like the signing of the visa agreement, just so very recently, are signs of hope for things to come. There is a lot that can be done by bringing countries and people together. And I managed to find a, a lovely quote from Pandit Nehru, who said in March 1947, when the Indian Council on World Affairs organized the first Asian relations conference in Delhi. And he said, Asia is again finding herself. He said, one of the notable consequences of European domination has been the isolation of the countries of Asia from one another. Today, he said, that isolation is breaking down because of many political and other reasons. Well, sadly, Nehru was proved wrong back then in 1947, but increasingly, he is being proved right. At the moment, only 5% of total world trade takes place within the area of South Asian regional cooperation. The potential for building that is huge. And if I could send one message to the work of your conference today, it would be not only 
to look back at what Nehru was saying in 1947, but to remember what Victor Hugo said a good 50 years before that. The only battlefields, he said, in the future will be those of markets open for business and the human spirit open for ideas. That has to be the way forward for South Asia. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sir Graham. Uh, I would uh, like to introduce you another member of the European Parliament. Now, Mr. Richard Czernesnetsky. It's complicated. Uh, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be here today at this conference on the merits of regional cooperation. As a member of the European Parliament from Poland, which has itself benefited from the merits of regional cooperation on our own stage, the European Union and indeed a member of the European Parliament's Committee on Regional Development, I'm pleased to see that this conference will open a similar dialogue in the South Asia context. The aim of uh, the conference is, of course, not to transfer an EU model onto South Asia, but to learn from the lessons we, we have learned here to promote a more open and tolerant society. The core values of democracy, equality, individual freedom, and social responsibility are rights that we tend to take for granted, but that are often hard fought for uh, in South Asia. It's not, uh, it's not uh, that uh, Europe uh, should impose its values on South Asia. Instead, it's to educate, but also to listen, to engage, and to respect to assist and to be flexible. Cultural, historical, religious, normative values might not coincide between the EU and South Asia, but the same is true of the EU. Through decades of work, the EU project has learned some lessons which may be valuable in the South Asia context. Some, of course, will not, but that is why we are here today to investigate and to discuss, and to uh, ultimately move forward. This forum is a unique opportunity to do exactly that. I am standing in a room with all of you, my colleagues from the European <coughs> Parliament, ambassadors, EU officials, estimate academics and honorable guests, and ask you to note that you, that we have a responsibility beyond the European borders beyond this continent to pass on our knowledge. What South Asian countries do with that know-how <coughs> is ultimately up to them. We can only provide tools. But what makes us qualified to do so? One of the European Union's motto is united in diversity. Through this motto, which we live day to day, we see how we can peacefully and democratically coexist and benefit from those differences, learning from each other and rejoicing in those differences for the good of society as a whole. The European Parliament is the democratic voice of the European Union, and these voices are many number, 754 members to be precise, and brought in view representing almost every aspect of opinion in the member states. So we break things down so that we can work forward. We divide the work into committees and delegations. We debate and we discuss and we engage. What seems impossible can be worked through when broken down into small chunks and most importantly, relevant pieces. This is what the South Asia Democratic Forum will, to do, will do today also. I'm delighted to see that the individual workshops this afternoon, uh, soon, will allow the participants to address concrete issues which can be worked on. By speaking in the specific rather, 
than the abstract, links can be forgot. Topics are diverse as education, the internet, nuclear threats, terrorism, food security, the SARC and energy will be discussed. Uh, this too is a lesson from the EU, tankability. The EU, as we know, was born from the ashes of the Second World War. But we also know that the original members of the European Coal and Steel Community, and later the European, uh, European Economic Community, come together to cooperate uh, economically. I know that many of our guests from abroad who are here today spend the morning in the parliamentarium, the European Parliament's visitor center, which traces the history of and evolution of the European project. And so I trust that this will resonate with, with you in particular. Every closer union followed the early days based on economic ties until we reach today's situation where member states retain sovereignty but are tied by common political values through our treaties. The system is not perfect, frankly speaking. Nor I am advocating EU style South Asia treaties. Uh, again, the aim is surely not to create another EU, but instead to foster dialogue, to promote cultural and commercial uh, linkages, similar to ours, perhaps, uh, building bridges, not regardless of ethnic and religious differences but in deference to them. That is the absolutely uh, cue. Tolerance and respect must always be to the fore. That is not to say that fundamentalism should be tolerated in any regard. Indeed, one of this afternoon's workshops will discuss how education uh, can overcome fundamentalism without infringing religious rights. Fundamentalism has led to the unfortunate situation where, uh, where be the ideological flow of Islam uh, is distorted for personal and political gains. Through engagement, through these very real and concrete issues facing the region of South Asia, this conference can provide a template for cooperation and hopefully momentum to move forward. The use of the word regional in the dialogue today is uh, significant, I feel. Origin, origin is, what is, of course, an area with definable characteristics, but not necessarily uh, definable uh, boundaries. The region of South Asia contains many sub-regions, just as the EU uh, uh, does. And also the countries in South Asia share uh, a commonality just as the EU, members, uh, as EU member states do. And the European Parliament, as a member uh, of the Committee of Regional Development, my work is concerned with an aware of the Union's regional policies. EU regional policy is sophisticated in its detail and not necessarily transferable to South Asia or its region uh, uh, therein. But at a basic level, its aim are solid and universally applicable. The general idea of investing in particular geographical areas to promote development makes sense. Regional policy in the EU is concerned with investing in regions within the Union to reduce economic, social, and territorial disparity. The com uh, commitment to this uh, idea is significant. The EU is uh, investing uh, uh, 347 uh, billion of euro in its regional policy between 2007 and 2013. This money goes towards improving education, investing in jobs, and improving transport links, as well as targeting money where it really makes an impact on the ground. There are surely lessons here for South Asia in that such investment reduce uh, disparity and ultimately leads to a better society at an EU level and better societies at the regional uh, level. A key point to note is, this, is that regional policy is tailor-made. I cannot emphasize 
enough that solutions uh, to problems in the uh, South uh, Asia context must be developed within that context. In this regard, the South Asia Association for Regional Cooperation, SARC, which will be explored in detail in two of the workshops later today, cooperates along 11 different regional policy areas and is composed of eight, eight South Asian countries. Whilst the EU cooperates culturally and at social levels through other initiatives besides regional policy per se, there are parallels to be drawn between the intention of, the, uh, of uh, both the EU and the SARC, namely to promote cooperation within. This is the real crux of the conference here today, to promote harmony uh, through dialogue, dialogue between uh, uh, us, all between South Asia and the EU, and within South Asia, and even within this uh, hotel. It's my hope that our policy victories, and indeed equally our policy mistakes will serve as both a lesson and reference point for South Asia countries moving forward. That to me is real value. For us Europeans in the room, I believe that equally we have much to learn from South Asia and a forum such as this can only be beneficial in terms of the knowledge imparts and the debate it gives rise to. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Charles uh, I would now like to announce the representative of the World Bank, Mr. Shandor Shipos. Mr. Shipos. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, Yes, I'm Sándor Sipos, I represent the World Bank Group here in Brussels. Uh, Ms. Chair, uh, distinguished uh, panel, my friend, my good friend, Paolo. I remember that um, uh, some time ago, Paolo came to me with a, a plan, a plan to start this enterprise. And he was asking me, Sándor, do you think that there is room here for one more think tank? How many do you know? I said, I know 125. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, you are asking a question I would ask, but I think today this turnout of people, the program we have, this uh, distinguished panel, and all the many reasons we were hearing already from the distinguished panel, why is South Asia important for us, I think is a resounding yes. And I think, while I think it justifies the effort, uh, we really have a lot of expectations uh, from what you and your initiative, your colleague, can bring to the, to the Brussels scene. I'd like to add one element to the many why South Asia is important. And that's uh, uh, something which may be shocking, maybe not uh, entirely uh, unknown to most of you, because you are tuned into this. South Asia, despite its very rapid development, uh, has the highest number people in absolute poverty defined by 1.25 uh, cents $1 a day. And of course, you can debate this poverty line, but the fact is that uh, still 570 million people live below that in this region, uh, a lot more than in Africa. Africa is below 400 million, and this 570 million is almost half of the total number of people who live in this real object absolute. So South Asia is important for us because uh, South Asia is the key how to fight poverty, a key terrain where to fight poverty. Our new president, Dr. Jim Kim, when he came to the World Bank, Korean American, 104 days ago, he told us, uh, I want to have two questions answered throughout my time with you. One question I am going to ask from everyone, from royals, from heads of states to stakeholders, partners, civil society, every individual. And I'm just looking because I think this is something that I would like you to type in your uh, internet browser. What will it take to end poverty? If you go into that website, you will see that there is a global dialogue which grew up in the last 104 days with a lot of, lot of great ideas. What will it take to end poverty? But then he turned to us because uh, he was saying, yes, you are 
uh, staff of a world class institution, but after all, you are just development finance guys. So tell me, what can we, what can you do to end poverty more quickly? At that time, we had uh, our chief, acting chief economist, and he asked him, how many years we need to eradicate poverty? And he was saying, depends on and what not. But that's not an answer. I want to have how many years? And he said, about 20 some. What will it take to cut it into half? And then in two days, uh, uh, Martin Ravario came up with an answer. And he said, it's interesting. It is probably doable. If we do it, we can actually ban the arc of history. This is a huge thing. Of course, it takes a lot of players to do it. World Bank is, uh, however important we think we are, we are just a catalytic agent uh, in this process. <laughs> so he went out and, uh, and asked that question from, from the very many players. And I would like to draw your attention that he will be coming out with his biggest speech tomorrow at our annual conference in Tokyo, in which he is going to tell the world what is it, what we, the World Bank, can do to help you, the whole world, to address this uh, immorally high level of poverty still out in the world. Now, uh, he didn't uh, mince his words. He didn't waste his time. He appointed a Chinese to run our private sector on IFC, already in place since uh, 1st of October. And he appointed uh, Kaushik Basu, the distinguished uh, Indian economist, as our uh, chief economist, also started this week. Uh, if you know him, he was economic advisor to Manmohan Singh, and he was the founder of the Development Economic Center at the Delhi School of Economics. So now we have an Indian who is uh, directing the, the fight in the thinking business in the bank, uh, how to achieve this uh, objective. If looking at a little bit closer to South uh, Asia, we can uh, really see and acknowledge that progress has been astonishingly fast. In the last 20 years, economic growth was around 6%. And that high tide was lifting many, many boats. And that was very good. And of course, we cannot uh, rely on that high tide only, because tides do change occasionally. But it is absolutely is, uh, stunning. It's only second to China and East Asia in this respect. And it is now slowing a little bit. It is slowing for two main reasons. One of them is the global crisis. And then the, uh, the other reason is internal, basically bottlenecks, what uh, uh, affect uh, these countries and also India. Just remember the huge power outage, uh, outage recently in India. Now, uh, if you look at the, the global crisis, uh, I can uh, say that the biggest contribution Europe could uh, do to uh, bring back uh, the region into high growth, the 6% of uh, growth, is to, to fix the Eurozone crisis. That would be the biggest uh, contribution. There are a number of uh, transmission mechanisms, and of course, this is no time to get into uh, the details of it, but this is trade, for example, for Pakistan and Bangladesh in textile, <laughs> commodity prices, finance, remittances, and, um, and uh, co-financing. And I should say a little bit also in certain countries, official development assistance. And President Van Rompuy at the other conference this morning in the Friends of Europe uh, State of Union uh, debate was proudly stating that uh, the EU is still a source of more than half of the world's uh, development assistance. So I think that what would be important is stabilizing uh, uh, the Eurozone and the European economy and provide a stable frame for uh, growth. I would like to very briefly just point out that there is something which is receding from the, the dialogue, the public talk, the issue of the climate change. And of course, there is uh, a lot of discussion, technical as well, political, about uh, the merits of certain statistics and what's true, what's not. What is very clear that in South Asia, we have about 500 million people who depend critically on the Himalayan river system, one of the most vulnerable to, uh, to climate change. And uh, the statistics are staggering, because by 2050, not that far away down the lane, it, just in Pakistan, there are 170 million people, there will be 300 million people dependent on that Himalayan river basin. Will there be enough water? Will there be enough water to, for people to drink and for the agriculture to develop? This is the second round of questions of what will it take to end poverty? What is it what we need to fix? For, for example, 
parts of the, the, the what we can do with climate uh, change and obviously the irrigation and the protection and the increasing the resilience of people in that. Let me uh, turn to the last issue, uh, what um, is probably the first issue for Paolo and <coughs> team. And that issue is the, the regional integration, regional cooperation. And I think it's, it's absolutely important. All of the speakers at this distinguished panel, if there was one common motive, that was the, the regional integration aspect. And I must say that this is not because South Asia would be leading in this respect. South Asia is lagging. And th this is uh, for, of course, many important reasons. It's an uneasy neighborhood, and many of these elements were spelled out better than I can and or I should, because I'm from coming from a non-political institution. But we've been looking into this uh, potential. We are coming out soon with the uh, studies which will be making the case for increased uh, uh, cooperation, showing the cost of not doing it. And uh, we are looking at low-hanging fruits, what can be harvested in uh, promoting regional integration, open border crossings to more trade, trade facilitation related to that. Connect the electricity grids of India with those of Bangladesh, Nepal, maybe also with Pakistan, and to facilitate more people to people contracts and of course obviously with the Himalayan river base joint approaches to upstream uh, water resource management. That also obviously involves a big East Asian neighbor whose name should not be mentioned. Thank you very much. And Paolo, I wish you all the all the best for this. Thank you very much, very much, Shandar, for uh, these uh, words and for this magnificent contribution of pointing out the way uh, that we have to perceive in our efforts. I think that all of us, we had a fantastic opportunity of hearing uh, outstanding uh, speeches of uh, personalities like uh, President Vitautas Landsbergis, Sir Graham Watson, uh, Member of the European Parliament, Joe Lyon, and Ch Richard Czerniecki, and of course, Shandor. Uh, I think that uh, we are very glad if you allow us to include your contributions uh, in a written form in a book that we want to publish on uh, this conference, because these were very important points. I uh, am not going to take any more of your time, just tell you that I'm very, very thankful and very happy for being uh, here with you. Uh, you are, all of you, you are old friends from my previous life, and uh, you have been uh, really helping me tremendously, and uh, uh, I think that uh, the continuation of the conference will go on in the same line. 